Good afternoon, dear colleagues and dear participants. Welcome to the uh, first international webinar of Ankara University. Uh, our first guest is uh, Professor Luciano Sasso from uh, Sapienza University, uh, Roma from Italy. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, to Professor Sasso very much for accepting our invitation. It's uh, such a, a pleasure. Uh, for us, because I know he's very uh, a busy person, uh, and in addition to his scientific activities, he's um, vice uh, president of the university. Also, he's uh, he's got a lot of international activities. He's the president of Unica. Uh, probably he will mention uh, some information about the Unica as well during his talk. So it is uh, such a great pleasure. Uh, welcome to our webinar, Professor Sasso. So uh, good afternoon. Uh, thanks so very much uh, to uh, Professor Susan for uh, the very kind uh, invitation. Uh, and uh, of course, to the University of Ankara. So I'm going to share my screen uh, now to uh, start my uh, presentation. I hope you can hear me. You can hear me well. Okay. So. I, uh, yes, we, we hear you. Before you start, uh, if you let yeah. me, I would like to read uh, your resume. Um, well, it's a long one, but I made it short uh, yeah. for, for our audience. Uh, so I would like to mention um, about some of your activities. Uh, Professor Luciano Sasso is uh, from Faculty of Pharmacy and Medicine, Sapienza University of Roma, Italy. And he received his PhD in pharmaceutical sciences uh, from Sapienza University. Uh, he is an excellent scientist uh, in the area of pharmaceutical sciences and pharmacology. Uh, also, he has more than uh, 200 scientific articles. Uh, he coordinates many research projects uh, in his field. Um, also, Professor Sazo has an uh, extensive experience in the international relations, and he is currently vice rector for European University Network at Sapienza University of Rome. And in the last uh, 15 years, he participated in many European and worldwide projects uh, as a speaker and a chair. Uh, many international conferences uh, of UNICA, also uh, S Group, European Universities Network, European Association for International Education, uh, European Association of Erasmus Coordinators, and so on. Um, so, uh, Professor Sasso is the president of a very important association uh, called UNICA. UNICA is uh, a network of universities from the capitals of Europe. Uh, Ankara University and also METU are the members of uh, this UNICA Association from Turkey. So it would be great if we have some information also uh, at the end of your talk uh, for uh, the UNICA and what we do in UNICA. So, uh, Professor Sasso, uh, of course, uh, COVID-19 affected us in every field. Uh, and education is especially uh, the important one uh, all over the world. So it is very important for us uh, if you share your uh, experience uh, of Italy and the world universities and education, of course, what, what happened so far. So thank you. Floor is yours. Perfect. Okay, so uh, good afternoon again. Uh, many thanks again uh, to Professor Susan for this very kind introduction. So I will make uh, an informal uh, presentation. As you can see, uh, I'm at home like most of the people uh, in Italy still uh, due to this uh, COVID crisis. So usually uh, I dress more formally for, uh, for our seminars, but I think you know in this uh, COVID uh, time, uh, one of the effects you know, is that also we can uh, uh, be more informal, and this uh, is you know, this big tragedy of the COVID-19 crisis. This can be also probably a, an advantage. So, um, as uh, Professor Susan uh, mentioned, I'm a vice rector at uh, Sapienza University in Italy and president of uh, of UNICA. And uh, maybe if you uh, keep closer to your mouth, yes, please. Microphone. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I will just, uh, okay, just, you know. Okay. 
So I will probably reduce now this to show the screen. Um, okay, so uh, first of all, okay, we have to uh, remember, of course, that we are still in a terrible crisis in this moment. Uh, these are data uh, coming from the Johns Hopkins University uh, showing the situation now. So we have uh, more than 3 million cases at this moment. Uh, the US is the country with the highest uh, number of cases and also the higher number, uh, highest uh, number of deaths, unfortunately more than 70,000 people at the moment, followed by other countries, uh, uh, you know, like the, the UK and, and others. So, First of all, our thoughts are, uh, you know, the people who lost their life uh, in, this, in this tragedy and all uh, the, the relatives and friends, uh, the people uh, very close to them. And uh, uh, concerning UNICA, um, first of all, just a few words. Uh, UNICA is an association which is uh, 30 years uh, old. Uh, at the moment, uh, we have uh, 53 universities in 37 capital cities of Europe. Uh, Europe uh, intended in a, in a geographical sense. Uh, so we have uh, uh, not only countries belonging to the European Union, but also countries uh, you know, uh, belonging to Europe in general. And Ankara University is a very important member of UNICA. So I'm very pleased that we have a very strong uh, cooperation between Sapienza and Ankara University and also within, uh, within UNICA. And uh, Professor Susan is an excellent colleague and a very good friend of mine. So UNICA uh, has uh, many activities. Uh, in the context of uh, this presentation, I want to mention that, uh, first of all, uh, UNICA has an important working group uh, related to education, which is called EduLab. Uh, we had uh, uh, several meetings in the last uh, uh, years about education. And the main topics that we discuss in EduLab uh, are actually uh, new ways of uh, teaching and learning and also higher education in the digital era. So um, I have to say that uh, uh, what is happening now in universities due to the COVID-19 crisis, um, you know, is also very much related to what we have been already discussing in, uh, in UNICA and uh, you, Luciano, your voice is not very clear. Can you keep it close, the, the microphone to yours? Okay. Yeah, I will. Try. Thank you. Uh, okay. So uh, I was saying uh, the audio lab, is, is it better now? Is it better? I hope. Because uh, yeah, I cannot do much more. Um, so uh, audio lab, uh, uh, as I was saying, uh, so is a working group of, of UNICA. Uh, you know, dedicated to uh, education. So uh, we have, uh, um, you know, uh, usually different sessions uh, related to uh, the discussion of education in UNICA. And the two of them are very much important in this moment because they are related to new ways of teaching and learning and uh, higher education in the digital era. And uh, as I was saying, during this uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, crisis, uh, actually we are uh, witnessing uh, a very high increase of digitalization in uh, uh, our university. So my first comment is that we have been discussing this for a long time, uh, but this is really the time in which we were forced to apply uh, many tools and many uh, ideas that we have been discussing for, for quite a long time. So I have to say that from the point of view of, uh, uh, COVID, of our universities, COVID-19, of course, uh, uh, is a big crisis, but also can provide some opportunities for changing uh, and improving uh, you know, the, uh, our activities. Uh, I want to start with, of course, teaching. Uh, um, of course, in many universities uh, uh, in Europe and in the world, we moved uh, teaching uh, online uh, modalities uh, and of course uh, this has been uh, uh, for me amazing because I mean uh, in just a few weeks uh, we managed to, to move uh, uh, most of the courses. Uh, Sapienza has a 300 degree programs and more than 100,000 students and actually we, we managed to uh, start to teach online most of them. Of course uh, this is uh, this can be more uh, challenging for some disciplines in which the uh, presence of the students you know, in, uh, in the whole is important, maybe for working groups 
for, for some uh, activities which must be uh, performed in person. But in general, I would say we uh, cope uh, quite well with this change. Uh, another aspect, of course, is related to the challenge that this online teaching uh, could have represented for some uh, staff members who were not used to uh, new technologies, you know, to digital activities, et cetera. And uh, again, I think uh, many of them did an amazing job you know, in adapting to this new way of teaching. Uh, we noticed uh, uh, in many universities the risk of a digital divide because, uh, of course, not all families were ready uh, to uh, support you know, the, uh, maybe their, uh, their children in uh, starting these activities. Uh, in some families, maybe there was uh, only one computer or maybe no computers at all. And you know, so some students uh, actually uh, forced no internet to, access. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So first of all, to stay at home and you know to be to be forced you know, to follow so many activities online, of course, requested the use first of all of technology. So either a laptop or a tablet, or and we noticed that of course in some families, you know, these uh, devices were not available at all, or as Professor Susan said, or maybe um, some homes were not connected to high speed uh, uh, internet. And that is another, another issue. So I would say I will link this possible digital divide also with the social economic divide. So when we talk about uh, digitalization of education, we have to consider that in the world there are uh, 700 million people who uh, cannot access uh, easily, you know, this new, uh, this new technology. So I think we should really consider uh, this, bar, this aspect very seriously for, for the future. Uh, another aspect is related to the competition uh, between universities and other providers of online education. This again is not something completely new, but uh, I think in this uh, new, uh, let's say post COVID uh, era, uh, this would be probably even more, uh, more challenging. You know. Uh, organizations like Coursera, edX, Future Learning, etc., who are providing already courses online, and of course, uh, without providing a formal uh, university degree, uh, but uh, they were they could provide certificates, you know, badges related to the courses that the students were uh, attending, and then uh, the exams they were performing after that. So this is a, uh, is another uh, is another challenge. Uh, because uh, we may imagine a world in the future in which maybe uh, some companies or other organizations may actually hire people without a formal education uh, delivered by a university, as long as the person, you know, maybe attended some courses and different, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, courses provided by other uh, organizations like the one. And most of them are not free, of course. Uh, some, of uh, them are, some of them are free, but... Uh, exactly. maybe... But it depends on the format. Some of them are, can be free, but then the certificate can be uh, can require the payment of some, of, of some money. It depends. Uh, but again, this is, uh, uh, I would say, something to, to, to consider in, our, uh, in, in shaping our, our activities. And uh, we have to say that universities are among the oldest uh, institutions in the world. Uh, sometimes in Europe, uh, I hear uh, you know, in some conferences uh, you know, that Bologna is the oldest uh, university <laughs> in the world. Of course, it is an old university, but not the oldest. There are some other uh, older universities in the world, and it is important to recognize. But you, know, you can see that these are uh, uh, you know, very, very prestigious and, and old, old institutions. And uh, uh, the question is, uh, will uh, we survive in this new uh, digital era? I think yes, uh, my, 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 of course, my reply to this question is yes, but of course we have to consider uh, these, uh, these new challenges. And uh, you know, Charles Darwin is actually uh, reminding us that uh, we need to adapt to the new situations to, to survive. So we need to uh, consider and look ahead to avoid, you know, uh, to be uh, actually uh, to travel too much in this uh, in this uh, exactly new, new situation. And another point, uh, again, in this uh, COVID time, uh, is related to mobility. 
uh, we noticed, of course, uh, recently, you know, uh, a big decrease uh, of uh, uh, the uh, physical mobility. Physical mobility nowadays is very difficult, of course, because of the social distances, because of the uh, impossibility to travel, etc. And uh, uh, we expect that uh, it will be difficult to go back uh, to the numbers of uh, uh, students moving physically until uh, recently. Uh, so I think we should really ref reflect very seriously on uh, uh, you know, the uh, uh, quality of uh, uh, virtual and blended mobility. Again, this is not a new topic for universities. We've been discussing this for a long time. But uh, uh, to be uh, very frank, I think sometimes it was a little bit, uh, uh, you know, theoretical uh, discussion because, of course, students uh, were uh, loving very much to move physically and then to go to Spain one, one year abroad in another university because, of course, attached to this academic experience, there was also a very important personal uh, experience, you know, uh, students um, go abroad, they make friends, they see uh, another country, another city, a new environment, etc. So this was motivating very much the students also to go abroad and to look, of course, for high quality education. But at the same time, of course, they were doing a very important experience for them. Uh, now that this physical mobility is uh, impossible, or at least uh, more difficult, uh, I think we should encourage, you know, virtual and blended mobility. And uh, to do that, I think we should improve the information available for the students to choose these online courses. At the moment, uh, we are providing courses online, but it's not so easy for uh, students actually to choose uh, these courses because the information is not very clear on our website. So I think we should really make an effort to uh, uh, you know, make uh, very visible uh, the courses available and uh, you know, the, the teachers who are teaching, their experience, et cetera. So that's, uh, I mean, to compensate uh, in a way uh, the motivation I was talking about. I mean, uh, to, to do some activities online and to choose a, a course uh, maybe uh, uh, in, a, in a university abroad online, it means that the students will have to anyway to uh, do an extra effort to do that compared to, uh, let's say, the activity at home. And he or she will do it if uh, really we will manage to show him or her that uh, uh, that's a very high quality course and it is worthwhile to listen to uh, some experts, maybe from some other universities about some topics. So I think we should really work now towards the quality of this virtual and blended mobility, because again, it's not a new concept, but it's something that I think we should really do in the next uh, six months or one year, uh, we will see a high increase uh, of these activities. Also because our students now are more used to that. I mean, uh, 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 one year ago, Propose a virtual mobility again was a little bit theoretical. Now that most students are used to online teaching, I think it is more uh, feasible to say, look, instead of listening to me from Rome to Rome, you can listen to another expert from Ankara, or from Brussels, or from from Berlin. So, I so think do you think it would be a good idea, at least for Unica member uh, universities, they are all very prestigious universities, so we can start maybe sharing information, online courses in yes. one platform, so it would be a great idea. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. First of all, I think, as I said, first of all, let's start to improve our websites. I think all the websites True. of most universities uh, I mean, are not clear in this respect. So, and then, of course, yes, we should find a way maybe to share, you know, this information within the networks. Uh, of course, uh, and then uh, Unica, of course, can help, you know, in this, uh, in this, in this regard. You know, it's, it's, it's very cool. uh, this is this is also going to open a door to virtual Erasmus. Because it was uh, the idea, you know, uh, it's going to be start very soon. Uh, they are planning already. And exactly. now 
uh, many of the universities are now settled and ready for virtual Erasmus because the online yeah. education uh, is started and going uh, quite well in many universities. So mm -hmm. the virtual Erasmus, maybe it's not very ideal. Uh, yeah. Visiting uh, and listening face-to-face uh, -face is much more important and valuable, but in these circumstances, mm -hmm. it, it would be a good idea. I mean, uh, yeah, it's an opportunity, I would say, because in, in one semester, of course, uh, I mean, physical uh, mobility, as we said, I mean, offers a lot of uh, other interesting stimuli to, to students, again, because these are experiences, you know, also in their life, you know, uh, and then, you know, we know there are many marriages and uh, children, you know, coming out of, <laughs> of the Erasmus. So I think there are data showing that really uh, this physical mobility activities uh, have been very, very relevant you know, in the last 30 years. Let's remember that Erasmus started in 1987, so it's uh, more than so 30 it's... years uh, of, of experience. But again, the opportunity here is to uh, provide high quality courses, I would say. Exactly. I mean, in one semester, let's say a student of philosophy may listen to, let's say, the best uh, professor in Europe or uh, around the world, you know, about one, maybe one philosopher, Kant, or uh, uh, another one, or maybe a, a student in mathematics, you know, can listen to a course of. Uh, so, I mean, uh, opportunity. Say, exactly. He or she can choose very high quality courses from different universities. So I would say virtual and blended mobility allows the selection of courses in different institutions. So this is an opportunity which is not easily provided by physical mobility. You cannot do uh, 10 different semesters around, uh, around the world, but you can do, uh, you, you can uh, I mean, go around uh, virtually and, and kind of try to pick uh, the best uh, course. Exactly. This, this I think is, is it, it, it's a good opportunity, but again, we need to work in the direction of the transparency and uh, providing the right information to allow students to, to choose. Otherwise, they will just, you know, they will get lost. They will not see uh, <laughs> uh, who... Uh, or, or, Chaos, chaotic. So, so, so this is an important part. And uh, in a similar way, I would say, when we talk about teaching staff mobility, again, this is an opportunity. Because uh, um, I, in my opinion, teaching staff mobility has been working well in the uh, last few years, but there is room for improvement uh, because uh, usually it's not easy to arrange, uh, uh, you know, a very high quality uh, staff mobility because very sure. often the requests, you know, they actually uh, come in the same academic year. So let's say uh, you or me, uh, we receive a request, let's say in January, from a, maybe a very good professor say, yeah, I would like to visit your university in uh, March or May or, or, or whatever. So in two or three uh, months time, and then of course uh, you try to accommodate, you know, this lack, but it's not easy to do that so with a very high quality. I mean, uh, online teaching, in my opinion, also in this case has a very good uh, opportunity because maybe uh, you in the first year, uh, the foreign teacher maybe can teach only online, maybe for one or two or three, just a few hours, let's say. So, I mean, uh, the students maybe of that course get to know him or her one year in advance. And then if, if things go very well, then in the next academic year, it is possible to plan the physical, the physical mobility. So in exactly. one day, online teaching mobility, can, uh, uh, let's say, be kind of a exploratory way to, to, to start the collaboration on the teaching. And so making sure that then the professor actually invited will actually uh, fit very well with the course in uh, which he or she is invited to, to, to teach. This is something that with the physical mobility is not easy to do. And now with, uh, again, online uh, uh, mobility is uh, easier because, uh, I mean, if I receive a request now, I can still uh, uh, try to accommodate maybe one hour lecture of a professor, maybe in one or two weeks. It's not so easy if my students are exactly. ready. Exactly, exactly. And then, you know, we say, oh, the, your lecture has been so much appreciated 
that I would like to invite you to stay for one week at my university and teach physically. So I would say this blended mobility again can be a very good opportunity to improve the quality of teaching staff mobility under the Erasmus program. So we can get some advantages from this pandemic. Yes. <laughs> yes. So far. I, I see, yeah. As I said, I see many challenges, but I see also many opportunities. Many and positive. And, and also for the administrative and technical staff, this is also an opportunity because uh, uh, we know uh, Unica has a project called uh, iMotion and we created the, this platform, uh, staffmobility.eu, which is very much used in Europe at the moment, to look for opportunities. But again, sometimes uh, when a person from the administrative or technical staff will contact another university to look for opportunities, many people will reply, yeah, I'm too busy to, you know, to host you for five days in my office. You know, I'm so busy with many of other course, yeah. uh, and also maybe staff weeks for exactly, Erasmus, exactly. online, so online case, staff weeks. Exactly. In this case, again, some online contacts can be useful because maybe two, two persons working in two different, let's say, Erasmus offices, for instance, in two different, they can start to, you know, connect by Zoom or by, by Skype, or by uh, Google Meet, et cetera, and work together before. So at the time when, you know, they really know each other and they like each other, then, uh, you know, you can start with the physical mobility and then you can invite a colleague to spend a few days and stay with you in your office. I mean, this is something uh, also, again, uh, which can be improved and I think it's another good opportunity. Exactly. So, and then moving on to another topic, of course, research in this COVID time has been also disrupted, I have to say, in many sectors. I mean, in many sectors, of course, experimental activities, sure. physical activities are, are very necessary, not only in science, but I mean, let's think also, let's say, of archaeology or many other uh, areas, architecture, etc. Of course, you need some physical activities and the social distancing, you know, was not allowing these activities. But on the other hand, of course, uh, there was an opportunity, you know, to uh, create uh, these uh, virtual working groups. Uh, even let's say uh, both uh, um, Professor Susan and myself, we are in the pharmaceutical sector and we know that the development of drugs also can benefit from uh, this sharing of data and information, et cetera. And I think in this uh, COVID time, we noticed that, you know, in the search for a new vaccine, you know, many organizations, you know, they, they, they try to join forces to, to speed up, you know, the process of uh, drug discovery in the case of COVID, because we cannot wait. The, the normal time of uh, developing a drug uh, is usually several years. And in this case, you know, we cannot wait several years. So there was, I would say, a new model of doing research uh, for uh, uh, searching new vaccines and, and drugs for COVID, which, I mean, can be applied to, to other sectors uh, as well, I think. So, and then moving on, of course, uh, as I said, for the administration also can be a, can be a good opportunity. Uh, I noticed even in my own university, Sapienza, that there was a very good improvement of many procedures. And, you know, the administration uh, really went very well towards a paperless uh, modality, you know, having uh, all the activities done uh, from home. And this is amazing. And then again, it's, it's very good. I think for all administration, even for environment, environmental, uh, you know, reasons, to try to remove uh, or reduce uh, the paper and make everything digital. I think it's very good. Uh, for uh, also other facilities, I have to say, of course, libraries were already uh, digitalized in many cases, but uh, I noticed also an improvement in this uh, in this case in many many universities. There were also generous offers from some uh, providers, you know, who uh, actually- Some databases are yeah. open. So it's, it's really nice actually in this uh, period so we have reached exactly. to many, many data. Okay, exactly, so again, this is another, another opportunity. And of course, uh, open access, you know, in Unica, we discussed a lot of open access in the last uh, few years. And of course, I think in this kind of crisis, we, we realized how important it is to access the information and so this is something that I think we should go back to discuss you know in, uh, in uh, university networks how to improve um, you know the access to, to information and then another element is related also to psychological support 
because of course in most of the, most of the universities already uh, some uh, facilities to support psychological uh, psychological students already existed uh, but you know there was an effort to move uh, online also these activities and for instance also at sapienza we supported some of the erasmus students who were abroad uh, when uh, the crisis started and they could not reach home easily i mean they could contact maybe this office and uh, just talk and you know share their worries about the situation and i think it was very very useful for 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 them and another point for me very very important uh, is related to this sustainable development goals because uh, of course in this um, covid time uh, uh, i really uh, realize even personally in my own telephone you know i received so many nice messages you know from uh, mm -hmm. so, many, so many different people even unknown people uh, you know talking about of course the importance of uh, you know human beings and the importance of this crisis you know of uh, many many values but so we have to be careful not to apply these concepts all, only to ourselves in our societies but really to think of the whole uh, all uh, world and uh, we have to uh, remember that the world is still uh, suffering uh, you know, before the crisis of COVID and after the crisis, still uh, we will have uh, several hundred million people hungry who do not have enough food. And, you know, one of the goals is uh, the goal, uh, you know, to zero hunger. Uh, we know that by 2030, we already know that we will not uh, be uh, expected to meet uh, this goal and uh, eliminate hunger from uh, the planet. And this is, again, something we should, we should reflect. I mean, uh, good health uh, is also something that, you know, when we talk about social distancing or washing hands, we have to remember that, you know, there are hundreds of millions of people in the world who cannot easily wash uh, their hands because there is no water or there is no access to, to, to masks, etc. So, I mean, I don't want to go to all the details, but uh, I think this scheme of the SDGs is very important for all of us to, to sure. remember. Uh, know that you have to keep in mind these goals and try to make uh, really uh, our world a better one. Uh, and I think this lesson of the COVID uh, I mean, can also teach us that you know, crisis can come. We should try to prevent crisis and make you know, all human beings you know, uh, in, a, in a better situation soon. Uh, another point I want to very briefly make is that, of course, uh, universities should have a very important role now in this uh, near future because of course we are going to face a very serious economic crisis uh, which in many countries will be the most uh, difficult uh, crisis in the last decades and i think universities you know can provide of course as experts can provide fora of discussion etc to really uh, give good advice you know to our governments etc and try to to make sure that you know the the damage made by um, you know this uh, crisis will be uh, reduced to the possible uh, mi to, to 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 minimize I mean the the crisis. And now uh, very briefly, I don't know how much time uh, do do I have, uh, Sibel? Um We have some more time. Uh, okay. well, it depends on you. I know you have any other. Uh, I'll just go uh, go very meetings. quickly. I just want to know, I dedicated, of course, enough time to this meeting, so I, I, I do have time. And I also want to uh, share a little bit more, just a few more ideas. And then, of course, uh, uh, I would like to open the discussion if there are questions from you or from other people listening to, to this. Okay. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, but very quickly, I just want to say something, of course, that we know that, you know, yes. uh, the birth of the internet, uh, I mean, uh, of course, uh, started before. But 1993 is actually the year in which uh, really there was a very concrete increase of websites. You know, there were at the moment at that moment only 600 websites. You know, if you can, it's very difficult to imagine. Uh, web it, 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 it was my PhD times, and it was a revolution. Yeah. It was um, exactly. I also feel that, I always I tell my students that I finished my PhD before the internet, so I have to say that. <laughs> and they asked, how did you do that? How did you find the, the I know it's, it's so difficult before <laughs> internet. <laughs> and also, this is also interesting. I mean, the, the information 
increased so much. I mean, probably now in during my webinar uh, by WhatsApp uh, and other uh, you know social media, I think we exchange more information than all the information exchanged by human beings in the. In the uh, it's a logarithmic day. increase. It's not like yeah, straight. It's really, yeah, it's really very much increasing, and. Uh, <coughs> This has a very strong impact on universities because now professors in this new digital era, of course, they should be guides for the students. You know, this is an image uh, coming from the Divine Comedy of Dante Alighieri. And you see Dante is on the, on the right and then uh, is guided by Virgilio, who is another poet. And then, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, you see there is no cathedra. It's not, uh, you don't see one person in a cathedra uh, kind of, a, um, showing the other <laughs> what to do is it, a, a way of uh, guiding you know this is i think what we should do with our students we should guide them through the uh, the information uh, they, they have uh, but uh, of course if they are smart at a certain moment they should know more than us this is the this is the idea and also we should try to change this uh, way of teaching from the traditional uh, type to the flip type you know giving assignments giving you know, uh, things to do before the real, uh, uh, you know, uh, meeting with the students so that they, are, they can be allowed to ask questions and to discuss the most critical aspects of, of the lecture. So I think this is more, uh, of course, effective uh, and, of course, more difficult for, for professors because, of course, then you are exposed to all kinds of possible questions. And, this, of course, it is more challenging, but I think it's more, more interesting for the students. We already spoke about MOOC, so I will, I will uh, go fast. Uh, another point, uh, I think in some universities, this is already happening to allow actually the use of the internet or telephones during the exams. Because in the end, you know, you can ask more difficult questions, you know, and then you say, okay, you can look whatever in the internet, <laughs> but if the question is really difficult, in the end, in uh, one hour or two hours, you, you, you cannot actually uh, you know, really frame uh, all that information in a good way and, and, and make a good assessment. So I would say this is also more natural because all of us, sure. uh, when, sure. we, when we work in, during our life, you know, we work, of course, with these tools. And still, you know, we try to use our ideas and our knowledge to, to, to work, to solve problems. But why we should use this uh, so unnatural environment in which, you know, the students they must it force you to search more. Everything, yeah, everything by heart. I mean, and especially you know, in our field, Sibel, you know, pharmacology or pharmaceutical sciences, there are so many things to remember that, of course, if you have to use your brain to remember everything by heart, then you don't have uh, neurons available to do uh, more, <laughs> more interesting things. <laughs> and now, what I heard, there are some artificial intelligence programs. Yes. Yes. Uh, during your exam. So uh, it blocks your uh, internet system. And so you have to uh, answer the questions without using all the other information. Exactly. So exactly. that's another uh, exactly. opportunity. Exactly. And this is, uh, again, another concept similar to the previous one. So information is available, but the connection of the points, uh, uh, meant so the creation of knowledge and creativity, <laughs> this is something that should be done at the university. This and is so great. In this case, you know, professors are very useful because in the end, if you just leave the students with all the points, uh, for them is more difficult to, to reach, you know, the little cat exactly. on the right. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, uh, you know, soft skills are more and more are True. important in our society. So we should, uh, in this uh, new digitalized universities, you know, pay attention to uh, the soft skills, you know, like, of course, communication, interpersonal skills, public speaking, etc. cetera. And, uh, uh, you know, we, I will go fast on this, mm -hmm. and these are things available. Uh, then the slides can be, of course, uh, available for, for the people interested. Uh, mm -hmm. I just want to say that this uh, website is very good, vita.ic.uk in which there is a really a very good uh, categorization of uh, soft skills. Let, let me make just one example here in this graph. Yes. If, if we go on the uh, uh, top right uh, quadrant uh, in this, uh, uh, let's say light blue quadrant, we have domain A. In domain mm -hmm. A, just as an example, we have knowledge and intellectual abilities. One of the subdomains is cognitive abilities, A2. And then we have some descriptors for cognitive abilities, such as 
analyzing, synthesizing, critical thinking, evaluate. So I think it's a very good uh, you know, scheme to look actually at ourselves also to see which are the skills you know, in which we think you know, we, are, we are maybe stronger or weaker and we can try to improve. And also Excellent. have some, uh, you know, many companies do this uh, so-called uh, 360 uh, degree evaluation. So they ask actually, uh, the, you know, their employees, you know, to try to, to, to answer to this question of which are your strengths or weaknesses, but also they ask your peers, they ask your supervisors, they ask your mm -hmm. collaborators. And this is, I think, is a very good uh, evaluation to try to improve ourselves you know, and our students. And this is just an example. For instance, in this case, this is an It's an a benzene ring. <laughs> it's <laughs> an aromatic ring or? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's not, it's, not a, it's, a chem, it's not a chemical formula. But no chemical. Yeah, for instance, this is a, these are two people, Tom and Suzanne. So we have Tom is blue. So in this case, Tom mm -hmm. is, a, uh, you see, uh, it's quite good in communication, uh, he score four. Is very good in technical knowledge, five. Is actually weaker as a team player. This is not uh, uh, impossible in a way because you may have a very good person, but maybe a little bit shy. He doesn't like, you know, to, uh, to play and to work together with many other people. It's very, it's very good. Uh, uh, again, uh, I mean, uh, Tom is a uh, three in uh, um, meeting deadlines. So a medium, I would say, uh, sometimes he misses some uh, uh, deadlines, is uh, quite good in problem solving and, and very good in punctuality. So this is just a, a very simple, I would say, uh, in a schematic way, the profile of Tom. And then you can see that, yeah, and Susan, Susan is similar, but for instance, Susan uh, cannot communicate so, so well as Tom. Is only, she only, only has one. Uh, but if you look, uh, let's say, at meeting deadlines, uh, Susan is better than Tom and uh, in problem solving as well. So this is another profile. So my experience also in my lab, for instance, is very good to have different people. So you may have a, a, very important. a team with people with different skills and different attitudes, and then the team actually uh, becomes stronger. So it, it's, it's a, I think it's a good idea. Then, of course, you can try to encourage, I mean, uh, both Tom and Susan probably should be encouraged to improve their team playing because maybe they're two, two people very good, but maybe they don't work uh, uh, well together. And, and so the supervisor can try to encourage them to, to work together a little bit more. Uh, and then here I will go very fast. This is another website. This is in French, uh, but uh, we'll go very quickly just to show you one graph from this report in which there is a, um, actually a straight line between uh, the data that are uh, reported in the X axis and in the Y axis. And very briefly, I will, uh, will tell you because it's in another language, um, but uh, that's in the X axis, we have the uh, skills which are actually appreciated by companies. And then on the Y axis, uh, we have the, uh, you know, the skills uh, which are developed during a PhD. And uh, in red, uh, you can find some uh, uh, very important skills appreciated by companies like the capability of managing a project, autonomy, uh, capability of collaborating, uh, et cetera. So uh, the idea is that during the PhD, but during the uh, higher education in general, uh, students again should develop these skills because in addition to the hard skills, uh, these uh, uh, again, skills are very much appreciated by, by, by companies. And then in a few few minutes, I, I will conclude. Uh, just I want to mention, of course, also this challenge of artificial intelligence. Uh, some applications are already uh, there, available. This is a paper published in Nature in 2017, in which uh, it was shown that actually there is an application for dermatologists in which you can make a photograph of a lesion on the skin of a patient and then in a few seconds, you already may have the confrontation of that picture with a very large database uh -huh. of pictures, you know, hundreds of thousands of pictures. And then in a few seconds, the application will tell you, ah, this is something you have to worry about or is something very normal. So it's, it's really, this is already uh, uh, out there working. And I mean, uh, uh, the point is, of course, uh, still when you study dermatology, you have to learn 
uh, of course, many things, but you cannot ignore that this kind of tools are already there. So it's like, you know, driving. And then of course, you know, we, we drive maybe without knowing what kind of engine <laughs> our car has. And uh, I mean, uh, this is something that we should, uh, we should, I mean, if you know as much as possible about the details, of course it's important, but these applications uh, will help a lot all, all professionals and in medicine, the, the change is, is really uh, going to be uh, very, very significant. Uh, so this is another example again from nature in which also dra drug discovery also will, uh, will change and will be improved uh, thanks to this, uh, uh, you know, new technologies. And also in, in COVID, uh, the moment uh, there are, uh, you know, algorithms which are used to try to look for, uh, for, for, for good, uh, good data. Uh, so um, this is this is a, a, an interesting quote in my opinion. That it's not for me, uh, but it's, I think it's very interesting that machines uh, uh, will not replace immediately humans. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> humans using intelligent machines will replace soon humans not using them. So again, exactly. the dermatologist in, in in five years who is not aware of this kind of softwares. I mean, it probably would be replaced by, by a more, I mean, uh, uh, let's say modern uh, person because he or she can be more efficient. So we should make aware our students about all these applications and also change. We need to have the courage to change the curriculum and study, you know, of course, uh, let's say again, uh, making another example in, in uh, medicine, you cannot study anatomy like we were studying anatomy 30 years ago because now there are softwares showing very well the organs or the tissues and everything in 3D. So uh, it's very important to, to do this. So uh, this is just a slide uh, reminding us that we, we should include in our curricula uh, the different aspects of artificial intelligence. And also uh, here I see a very good uh, possible development. Mm -hmm. So if we look back, I mean, all the scholars until uh, I would say a couple of centuries ago, there were really uh, scholars knowing most of the knowledge available uh, at their time. I mean, uh, philosophers who were also very expert in mathematics, they knew uh, whatever was known about- Anatomy, uh, pharmacology, and uh, pharmacy. So the, the development of the disciplines is very, very recent. And I have to say that now this digitalization, giving access so easily to information can allow us to study again in a different way, trying to know, I mean, uh, really the most important things <clears throat> of all subjects, knowing that the details will be available. So, I mean, if I forget, let's say even in our field, the dose of, of a drug with my telephone in one second, I can find exactly. again that number. I mean, it's not a problem, but if you don't know at all, that, that, that a certain drug exists or that a certain uh, you know, symptom exists, then it's very difficult to find that information you know, in a few minutes or, or hours. So we should again probably teach our students in a way you know, that they will remember the most important concepts, that they will have frames, and then some of the details you know, can be found uh, uh, later on. And this can exactly. actually can help us in going towards interdisciplinarity again. And that, of course, was Leonardo da Vinci. And then uh, just um, I'm going to finish in a few seconds. Um, another uh, point, of course, is related to ethics. So ethics and philosophy are so important nowadays because uh, engineers, you know, divide, uh, you know, designing, for instance, uh, self-driving cars, they should know uh, all this because uh, maybe a car without a driver, I mean, uh, of course, uh, will make choices sometimes in case of an emergency. And these uh, choices are actually driven by uh, the mind of the developers of the software behind that car. So you need to really be very, very careful with the ethical and also legal responsibilities. You know, who is responsible for a certain choice uh, if, if uh, no humans will be any more involved. Uh, another point is uh, related to slavery. I mean, uh, these machines uh, in a few decades may become very, very intelligent. If they become intelligent, uh, they may uh, suffer, uh, let's say, uh, below uh, the orders of human beings because uh, the way 
they, they may think at a certain moment that uh, we are actually less clever than them themselves. <laughs> so this, is, uh, is, it, this is already in the in the movies. There are some good movies on these topics, uh, and I think uh, I think it can happen in the reality. So we have to be prepared to that <laughs> and then uh, try to avoid. It might happen. Yeah, uh, with with a big difference because, of course, uh, slavery was a, 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 I mean a terrible I would say uh, I mean uh, experience that humankind had, and luckily I mean. Uh, it is uh, forbidden uh, nowadays, at least in the most, uh, I would say, formal way. Uh, but mm -hmm. slaves, in a way, were humans like us, so they were, they were fighting for equality. Uh, the, the different scenario here is that uh, these new slaves may fight uh, to say that, uh, you know, they may uh, think of uh, being superior. So in, in the third line, uh, I, I also imagine, this is again uh, science fiction for the moment, <laughs> human. so we have to be prepared to the risk that you know some machines will uh, again uh, you know again but all science fictions comes true recently <laughs> so yeah. we have to be careful exactly and also i mean to be a little bit now on a more uh, lighter note uh, also there are movies about love between machines yeah. and humans and again this is uh, another interesting topic and then conscience of course of this issue. so again all these topics uh, should be discussed uh, i think at university to to, to prepare and to avoid uh, mistakes, because of course some of these mistakes can be avoided, and then uh, based on our history of a millennia, we should be prepared to do to the future. Already, uh, the, this is a very um, uh, concrete example. Uh, for instance, uh, the Polytechnic of Milan is one of the best schools of engineers in Italy, and then they, they study ethics now formally, and this is something uh, relatively new. And then I, I stop here, and I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Sasso. Uh, you shared many, uh, many valuable uh, ideas and information and some very useful links. Uh, so uh, actually all the uh, people who cannot allow to watch uh, today, they, they may uh, actually watch it later and they can use all these information. Uh, so I, I thank you very much. Uh, so I, I would like to ask you uh, maybe the first question. Did you uh, see what was happening in Turkey from Italy uh, in order to the education? Uh, did you have some ideas what happened in Turkey? I've been informed, but not to be honest, uh, uh, not in details. But well, we, we can't hear. Yeah, yeah. You, you can you can tell me more because I know about certain aspects, but of course uh, you are much more expert about what is going on in Turkey. So I would be very much uh, interested in uh, knowing more about the situation. Uh, mm. yeah. Actually, we were one of the luckiest nations, maybe, uh, because our higher education system acts very rapidly, and uh, all these uh, formal education in universities suspended. Uh, straight away when these uh, COVID-19 spread. So uh, they act very rapidly and we started the online programs uh, soon after these suspensions. Of course, we have many, uh, 207 universities in Turkey and not all of them are very successfully adapted to these online programs. Uh, again, we are one of the lucky uh, universities in Turkey uh, but many, many more universities adapted these online programs. Uh, of course, like you mentioned, there are very uh, many side effects of these online programs and uh, regarding the students, less fortunate students who can't apply the programs. And also you have to create more uh, concentrated programs to uh, give the students and some in some applied um, sciences we have problems of course laboratories and uh, some internship uh, programs like medicine dentistry pharmacy we have problems but we try to overcome these problems uh, now we uh, wanted to use some simulation laboratories for students it's very new and probably it will be very effective uh, for students of medicine, pharmacy, engineering students. 
also uh, we demonstrate the laboratory uh, experiments uh, while well, the assistants are demonstrating these uh, lectures and courses the students are watching so it's not of course effective as the, the practice in the lab but uh, we are recording these experiments for the students uh, also for the exams we choose uh, maybe not very strict rules uh, for the exams for homeworks uh, so we try to push students to do more research uh, so maybe another uh, positive aspect of these uh, COVID. So it was such a challenge in Turkey because almost mm -hmm. 8 million uh, young university students we have. So it, it's a very large population. So we had to act very fast uh, to mm -hmm. keep these students uh, mm -hmm. to, to follow the uh, courses. So, so far we managed um, and I hope we in this autumn uh, semester, we start this formal education again, normal face-to-face uh, -face education, but uh, I still don't know. The, I think the world is not knowing what's going to happen yeah, in, yeah. In, in, in autumn. So we have exactly. to, to prepare uh, well exactly. uh, for the upcoming maybe uh, yes. extended uh, this pandemic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe I have to check the questions. Uh, my assistant sent it to me, but um, can, can you please check? Well, you have uh, many nice comments. Thank you. <laughs> so Thanks. so I, I will summarize them. Too many Thanks. nice comments. I'm getting jealous. So <laughs> I, I will uh, make it Thank short. You. Thanks for this beautiful and understandable presentation. And it's coming from uh, the social sciences uh, part of the Ankara University. So it's much more oh. important because, okay. uh, <laughs> because from the health science people, it's not always uh, easy to... Yes, uh, I, I always say that the social sciences and the humanities will be more and more important in the near, in the near future. Because again, <laughs> yeah, for, for machines will be easier to tackle the scientific aspects, but for the humanities, I think we still uh, will need humans for quite a while. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, one of our uh, Bologna coordinator asks, uh, yes. we will have to update the Bologna system uh, according to these uh, procedures, new procedures. This is an interesting question. Uh, as you know, the ministerial conference of the ministers of education of uh, the uh, Bologna uh, process. And if I remember correctly, now we have 48 countries in the, in the Bologna process. They were supposed to meet in Rome in June, in a few weeks, but they postponed the meeting mm -hmm. due to the COVID crisis, and they will meet in November. So actually in November, we will see the new communique. As you know, in the Bologna process, every two years there is a communique, uh, by the, you know, the, 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 the ministers of education, together with the other actors of uh, uh, the Bologna process, including students, the um, European Students Union are an important actor. And we will see, because uh, for sure, I mean, uh, the meeting in November 2020 will be very much affected by this crisis. And again, some of the topics I think that we discussed today uh, will be there. So how universities actually will We'll have to respond. I mean, and again, uh, these uh, issues of uh, mobility because in the Bologna process uh, since uh, 1999, of course, uh, mobility was one of the key issues. And of course, usually we were talking about physical mobility. As I said, we are going to move uh, now very much towards uh, virtual and the blended mobility. And so we will see. It would be very interesting to listen to the communique. Uh, will be after uh, in the second half of November. Uh, Half of November, yeah. This this summer we have to wait to uh, actually exactly. uh, finish it's a, this. It's a, it's a very good question. I'm looking forward to, to see what, what's going on. 
So uh, another question, well, well, actually we mentioned quite a lot, but maybe they, they want a summary. What is the, yeah. the most positive impact and the most negative impact uh, on the education this, uh, regarding COVID-19 uh, pandemic? Yeah, probably, yeah, probably yeah. in uh, one word, yes, this uh, digitalization, uh, I mean, uh, it, it, it is, again, it's something that we are doing finally. Uh, again, it's not new because uh, we have been... I mean, uh, using uh, these tools uh, maybe for specific uh, uh, events, etc. But now it's becoming so uh, much common, you know, to use uh, uh, teleconferences, uh, you know, teaching online, etc. So I would say that this is the most positive effect for universities. And this is a big tragedy. I mean, this again, as I mentioned, COVID-19. I mean, uh, is really um, having a very high number of uh, victims and a very a uh, high economic crisis, so there are millions of uh, people in the world who uh, lost their jobs. So it, I think it's a really very, very big tragedy. But I mean, one positive aspect, again, for, for, for education is this possibility of doing things online and to have the availability, again, of experts, uh, you know, from different countries, from different universities, you know, ready to participate in a webinar, ready to participate in a, in a which was possible before, but since we were not so used to that, I mean, it was a little bit more difficult. Even in this case, you know, Sibala would have come to Ankara maybe for this meeting and have a, an in-person meeting, you know? Without the COVID, you, you would have said, why don't you come? And then I would have uh, taken a plane. And of course, I, I, I love to travel to Turkey. But I mean, in this case, maybe in a few days, we organize a, a webinar like this, you know, that maybe a, a few weeks exactly. ago uh, was something that we would not have done. So this is a very positive aspect. The, I would say, uh, the negative aspect is this uh, reduction of physical mobility. Because exactly. It is also interesting. Uh, we meet in a meeting, you know, with uh, 20, 30 people, uh, the students meet in a class. And again, in this physical mobility, there are many other aspects related to our uh, human interaction that is also, is also very important. And this this will be reduced. So in a way, mm, uh, I would say uh, students now, they were used to travel so much for uh, uh, you know mobility programs, for vacations, etc. Uh, unfortunately, I'm afraid that at least in the next few months, it will be more difficult and more expensive also. I mean, the sure. uh, cost of flights, for instance, was so low recently that it was very easy for the students to travel and go to another camp to spend the vacation and learn you know, about. So I think uh, at least for some time, we will go back to a different world in which uh, to travel will be more challenging, more expensive. And I think this is a lot because uh, I really think about that, uh, this, I would say, Erasmus world in which you know, millions of students, millions of young people could travel and go around was a positive thing. So I think we have to kind of uh, uh, redesign and, and I hope that you know, we will find a way to, to go mm -hmm. back to this mobility because it was so important to, to, to do that. So uh, I will ask the last question uh, from me. Uh, what, what is your plan for uh, Unica as a president? Uh, you are a very successful president and Unica mm -hmm. is <laughs> rising up. Well, um, I'm not saying this uh, because I'm one of the steering committee member. I'm saying that the well, last maybe uh, six, eight years, uh, you are performing uh, such a good uh, job in Unica. So, what is the plan for uh, the no, next? Yeah, Unica for sure will dedicate, you know, in the next uh, meetings, will dedicate uh, very high attention to this crisis. I mean, and some of the topics that I mentioned, of course, will be uh, discussed uh, very deeply. So, we are planning to have the General Assembly of Unica will be uh, in November in Berlin. And then some of the topics, of course, will be discussed. We, we cancelled, of course, all the physical meetings now until August. But I hope uh, to be able to resume uh, in September, October. I mean, uh, my hope is that we will be able to have uh, I hope so. that kind of physical, physical meeting. But uh, of course, so we will try to keep open a little bit also the possibility again to stream uh, meetings, you know, to have the possibility of people a bit to participate uh, online, etc. This will be again an improvement. And uh, I mean, I think uh, in, in Unica, since we are 
a very good forum, as you said in the beginning, of 53 uh, universities from uh, 32 different countries. So really, uh, we can share experiences uh, going from uh, Lisbon until uh, Moscow, from Ankara uh, to Reykjavik. I mean, we have a really uh, a very high variety of situations and countries and society. So I think it would be very interesting for, for UNICA members to discuss all these issues uh, in the General Assembly, as I said, in November, but also in the rector seminars that we're going to organize, and also in the working group. Because UNICA has a, this working group I mentioned about education, but we have another one about research. We have another working group related to PR and communication, scholarly communication. Uh, UNICA Green is related to sustainable development. So I would say all the working groups, uh, uh, you know, uh, will uh, will discuss uh, about this. Uh, we have a, a working group of related topics. So I would say for uh, this COVID-19 crisis is affecting all uh, internationalization activities. And I think for UNICA, again, will be a challenge, but also an opportunity to discuss and to learn from this crisis. Exactly. So, uh, Professor Sasso, I would like to thank you very, very much uh, for your time and for sharing your experience and all your knowledge regarding the education uh, in, in this uh, COVID uh, pandemic. So, uh, thank you so much. And I would like to meet you uh, in another platform. <laughs> thank, you. thank you very much, uh, Sibala, Professor Susan. Thank you very much also to the people who were listening online. And I hope uh, that the communication was clear. Sometimes I know that the voice is not uh, uh, very clear through these uh, you know, uh, systems, but I hope that the people could manage to understand what I said. And again, thank you very much for your attention and we keep in touch for possible collaboration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.